with a news update on 99.7-1450 WHTC. I'm Gary Stevens. Tom Jessup is apparently just keeping the Allegan County Board District 3 seat warm for the next occupant. The longtime commissioner, who was named two weeks ago to replace the late Dean Kappinga in representing the southwest corner of the county on the governing panel, won't have his name on the November 5th general election ballot. The executive committee of the Allegan County Republican Party voted to nominate Brad Lubbers of the Fenville area for the spot on the ballot that was vacated by Kappinga's death on August 5th, and County Clerk Bob Janetsky said that he would agree with that request. Lubbers had been considered by the board to replace Kappinga before the panel decided on Jessup. Allegan County Democrats did not submit a name by the April deadline for the District 3 election, but Christy Allen, also from the Fenville area, will reportedly submit her name as a write-in candidate. She was the Democratic Party nominee six years ago, but lost to Kappinga by over a 1,000 votes. Due to the Labor Day holiday, the Zealand City Council will hold its bi-weekly business meeting tonight instead of on the usual first Monday of the month. The governing panel is expected to approve a $15,300 contract with Progressive AE to conduct a traffic study surrounding streets around Cityside Middle School, Zeeland Christian School, Lincoln Elementary School, and the Early Childhood Center. Traffic flow concerns at those locations was noted by council when it put together a strategic action plan earlier this year, and this study is expected to help in coming up with solutions for this issue. Meanwhile, Assistant City Manager Kevin Plockmeyer has brought to the attention of council members options should Olive Township voters continue to reject a library millage renewal request. The electorate said no last month by 55% of the vote, and should the matter be turned down again in November, the city will need to revoke its contract with the township for residential access to the Howard Miller Library. A 5.45 p.m. work study session is planned ahead of the 7 p.m. business meeting to be held in chambers at Zeeland City Hall off of Elm Street. An online link to the agenda and supporting documents is in this story at whtc.com. Holland had its truck parade yesterday, and over 30,000 strolled the Mackinac Bridge. But Grand Haven had its annual Labor Day tradition yesterday. It wasn't a five-mile-long span as the Big Mac, But the 210-foot-long 3rd Street Bridge was crossed by hundreds and continuing a 20-year-old tradition that ends the summer tourism season at Coast Guard City, USA. Councilman Mike Fritz is Mayor Pro Tem for the Ottawa County seat. I've seen people downtown, they're carrying bags, and that which is a good sign. According to the state, about 10% of all employment in Grand Haven is tied to tourism, and over 2 million people visit GH every year. The businessmen haven't really told me how well they have done yet, because it's... Not quite done yet. But this after today, this is it right here. Then you come to Labor Day, it pretty much slows down a lot. Well, Holland, Grand Haven, and Mackinac City, St. Ignace had its annual events. Officials in the Saugatuck Douglas area hope to revive its Blue Star Highway Bridge Walk next year after calling it off for 2024 due to logistical issues. The only reported major injury crash along the lakeshore over the Labor Day holiday weekend occurred on Friday evening south of Grand Haven. First responders were dispatched to Comstock Street and 172nd Avenue around 7.35 p.m. That was where a westbound SUV driven by a 68-year-old Holland woman apparently drove through a red light and was hit by a northbound SUV driven by a 34-year-old Grand Haven woman before rolling over and landing on its roof. The two motorists, along with three passengers in the second vehicle, a 56-year-old Texas woman, a 12-year-old girl, and a 4-year-old boy, were all taken to undisclosed local hospitals for treatment of what was initially described as non-life-threatening injuries. No names were disclosed, as the incident remains under investigation. The Oceana County Sheriff's Office says a 20-year-old Coopersville man died in a crash on a quad runner on Sunday at Silver Lake Sand Dunes. He crashed into a side-by-side in what the Department of Natural Resources calls the roaming area and not on the dunes or the drag strip. The roaming area is mostly flat. Deputies say drugs and alcohol do not appear to have been factors in the crash, no name initially disclosed. Muskegon Heights Police are investigating the shooting death of a 29-year-old man on Sunday morning. It's been identified as Michael Stewart, was found inside a white Buick and been shot several times. State police, Muskegon Heights police say they do not have a motive for any suspects at this time. Gas prices in Michigan are down four pennies a gallon in the past week. AAA says the average is now three thirty-five, down 34 cents in both the past month and a year ago at this time. A 15-gallon fill-up calls 
$50 on average statewide. Michigan's most expensive gas is in Jackson at $347, while Grand Rapids has the lowest price at $318. The Lakeshore is nearly uniform, with Ottawa County averaging $315 and Allegan County just a penny more per gallon. Jim Dreyer is nothing if not persistent. The 60-year-old ultramarathon swimmer from Grand Haven stepped into the waters of Lake Michigan from Grand Haven City Beach last evening for a fourth attempt at what he calls the first continuous self-sufficient swim across the Great Lake. Dreyer will be towing an inflatable dinghy, carrying over 200 pounds of supplies and self-navigating materials as he goes towards McKinley Beach in Milwaukee, a nearly 83-mile direct excursion that he projects can be done in 72 hours or more without sleep. Last month, Dreyer had nearly reached a halfway mark before having to halt the attempt due to loss of battery power with his navigational unit. Two similar attempts eastbound from Milwaukee last year were stymied by weather-related issues. Dreyer, who has been successful over the past two decades in long-distance swims throughout the Great Lakes, is raising money for the U.S. Coast Guard Chief Petty Officers Association. A link to this latest effort is in this story at whtc.com. For the second time in less than a year, violence has marred a Comstock High School varsity sports event. This past Thursday, as the Parchment Panthers were on their way to a 53-0 victory over the visiting Colts in the football season opener, an altercation broke out near one of the end zones. The district says a fight involving students and adults escalated very quickly Thursday night as the school was playing against Comstock. The stadium was evacuated and students were held in the school until it was determined that there were no threats. The district says no weapons were found and an investigation into the incident is ongoing. I'm Dan Evans. According to media reports, three Comstock High students were believed to have been involved in at least one of the fights. No immediate disciplinary action was taken. Parchment, which is a member of the Southwest Athletic Conference, that includes Saugatuck and Fenville, hosts Coloma this coming Friday night, while Comstock visits another SAC opponent, Allegan, also on Friday night. Last December 14th, a group of people fired off shots in the parking lot outside of Comstock High School during a boys' basketball game between the Colts and visiting Lawrence. Nobody was wounded, and one CHS student was removed as a result. 30,000 people took part in the annual Labor Day Mackinac Bridge Walk yesterday. Mackinac Bridge Authority Director Kim Nowak says 30,000 is on the upper end of the range of the 21,000 to 35,000 that have walked the bridge in recent years. It was an absolutely beautiful day, cloudless skies, giving unobstructed views of the Straits of Mackinac. Governor Whitmer was in Detroit for a presidential campaign rally with Democratic nominee Kamala Harris. So Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist led the walk that started at 7 a.m. and ended at noon. The 14-year-old boy was shot and killed in the Michigan State Fair parking lot on Saturday has been identified as Darian Davis, a sophomore at University High School in Ferndale. School Superintendent Camille Hibbler wrote in a letter to parents that they believe Davis and another 14-year-old boy were shot in an isolated incident. The other boy is still in the condition at a hospital. Uh, they will take additional security measure today to ensure student safety. The fair ended yesterday with increased police presence and shorter hours at the Suburban Collection Showplace in Novi. Kamala Harris continued a Democratic Party tradition in Detroit yesterday. The vice president, who is the Democratic Party presidential nominee for 2024, spoke during a rally at the gym of Northwestern High School. We celebrate unions because unions helped build America and unions helped build America's middle class. It was her fourth trip to Michigan this year, her second since becoming the Democratic nominee for president. You better thank a union member for the five-day work week. You better thank a union member for sick leave. You better thank a union member for paid leave. You better thank a union member for vacation time. Democratic presidential nominees have traditionally spoken to Detroit on Labor Day, the most notable being that of John Kennedy at Cadillac Square in 1960. Voters across the state and around the country head to the polls nine weeks from today. And lost amidst the presidential hubbub nationally, the U.S. senatorial battle in Michigan, and the contentiousness of the state Republican Party convention in Flint 11 days ago, was the GOP's entrance into the state Supreme Court race. The convention delegates agreed to put State House Representative Andrew Fink of Osseo and Branch County Circuit Court Judge Patrick O'Grady on the November 5th ballot. Fink is seeking an eight-year term on the high court to replace retiring Judge David Viviano, and he admitted 
that the nominating process for the high court in Michigan is somewhat unique. Absolutely a new experience, um, one that uh, I think probably plenty of people who've done it would, would say uh, they're, they're glad they've had it, but wouldn't necessarily recommend it <laughs> in, uh, in some ways just because it's an extremely intense uh, uh, day uh, there on the floor. So um, it was it was honestly a lot of fun, but of course also rewarding to, to see the hard work that we've, we've done for the last 11 months pay off and on to the next stage. Fake is now up against U of M clinical law professor Kimberly Thomas, for whom he had been a mock trial judge for her program at one time. The court should you know, stand up for law and order uh, and stand up for the due process of every citizen deciding cases based on what the law says, not based on what the judge's preferences are or who the parties are or who their par- the party's friends are. So that's, that's the message that we needed to convey. And in terms of choosing a, a candidate for justice at this convention, another aspect of that was that I, you know, I was the only candidate position to be a transformational leader on the court, taking the court um, into the future. Uh, the mandatory retirement age of 70 in, in our state means that uh, while, while my opponent could have only served one term, I could serve into the 2050s, which I'm not promising to stick around for, uh, but uh, the ability to, to serve longer and kind of be that transformational figure uh, was, was certainly a part of, uh, of the attraction as well. Meanwhile, O'Grady looks to unseat Justice Kyra Bolden for a four-year term. You know, what I saw uh, both as a young prosecutor and as a trooper and as a young judge, we always had this very conservative rule of law, great constitutional court with the high-level uh, wisdom on that court and many times senior judges. And I saw the court simply, I think, slowly kind of dissipate with that kind of talent. And I think I want to be able to... Uh, to bring that to the court, uh, to be able to have that, uh, you know, senior judgeship uh, and knowledge uh, to kind of bring that forward going forward in the fall. Although Fink and O'Grady were nominated by a partisan party, their names will have no party affiliation after them when voters go to the polls for the November 5th general election. Joe Musgrove and three relievers teamed on a six-hit, ten-strikeout shutout as the San Diego Padres blanked the visiting Detroit Tigers yesterday 3 nothing. Idle tonight, the series at Petco Park continues tomorrow evening with broadcast time at 9.15 p.m. on 99.7-1450 WHTC. Brian Reynolds, three-run homer in Pittsburgh's eighth inning, tied the game, and two batters later, Andrew McCutcheon's solo blast broke the deadlock as the visiting Pirates rallied past the Cubs last night 5-3. It started with, you know, the guys before me, the guys getting on, uh, IKF getting in the game, pinch hitting, uh, big hit for him, and then just continuing that to go down the line. The series at Wrigley Field in Chicago continues this evening. Gunnar Henderson, Cedric Mullins, and Austin Slater each drove in three runs as the Baltimore Orioles walloped the visiting Chicago White Sox yesterday 13-3. The series in Oriole Park at Camden Yards continues this evening. Idle last night, the West Michigan Whitecaps entertained the Lansing Lugnuts at LMCU Ballpark in Comstock Park this evening. Get the latest news anytime at whtc.com.